worked well. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm going to um, talk about uh, my book for a bit, um, maybe about half or a little bit more than that. And then I think we'll open it up to questions. Um, and um, what I'm gonna do is it's kind of a complicated book. So I'm gonna explain um, first its origins, um, how I came to be that I wrote a book about air conditioning of all things. Um, and then we'll get into um, how it's structured and um, maybe some of the quirky um, and uh, important um, historical anecdotes of the history of air conditioning and, and it's uh, why it's important to think about today. And um, I apologize in advance if you hear my radiator um, going, um, broadcasting from my uh, apartment in Brooklyn and it's very cold here today. Um, okay, so uh, this is my book, which might be appear backwards. Um, After Cooling on Freon, Global Warming and the Terrible Cost of Comfort. Um, I um, never thought that I would write a book about, of all things, air conditioning, and more specifically, um, Freon, um, air conditioning refrigerant. Um, so how did this come to be? Well, um, I had been wanting to, I'm trained as a writer, as an essayist, and um, I've written about a lot of things, um, but I, about seven, six, seven years ago, I was really looking to write about climate issues. Um, and I didn't really know how, uh, as many of you, I'm sure experience, um, the climate crisis is so huge, so overwhelming that it's really hard to, um, get away in. It can feel, um, incredibly debilitating. And, uh, uh, I was trying to write about something that was so big that the writing became general. Um, and, after a little while, I realized that um, uh, a close friend of mine, uh, whose name is Sam, who features um, hugely in the book, um, his partner, Rebecca, who's also a friend of mine, um, kept telling me, you know, you should really talk to Sam because he has this incredibly odd, bizarre job um, that's related to the climate. And I think you should interview him about it. I think you should write a profile of him. And um after a little while, she said this about two or three times. And finally, I took her up on it. And I started to talk to Sam about his job. We were close friends, but I didn't really know um, what he did at the time. And as we started talking, um, uh, I started to understand just how strange his job was. His job was to, um, at the time, he was working for a small um, green energy startup. And his job was to drive around the continental United States looking for canisters of used Freon. Um, that's the uh, air conditioning fluid. Uh, actually, it's a it's a gas at room temperature, but um, when it's compressed in a can, um, it's uh, liquid. So it's the um, basically what makes your fridge, your freezer, your air conditioner work. Um, it's no longer made. Um, its production is banned. Um, globally, which is something we'll get to in just a second. Um, it is responsible for the uh, ozone crisis, the hole in the ozone layer um, in the 70s and 80s, and which is still ongoing, actually, um, although the culprit has been squashed. Um, but uh, much to Sam's surprise, um, there are still millions of pounds of Freon, which is a brand name, um, so I'm gonna kind of switch to talking about Freon to talking about CFCs, which stands for uh, chlorofluorocarbons, um, because you might hear that uh, your fridge needs, a, or your car air conditioner needs um, a refill of Freon, um, but it's actually not the same chemical as it used to be. Um, so uh, what he was finding was that there were millions and millions of pounds of CFCs um, that had been made but not used, um, scattered throughout the United States. And um, he and his company were finding that they could actually go uh, to these um, car mechanics, uh, auto hobbyists, people who had hoarded or um, just kept um, Freon, bought them on the secondary market, which was legal at the time, uh, still is legal, um, and then destroyed it 
for carbon credits through California's cap and trade system. So the cap and trade system uh, in California allows you to destroy pollution elsewhere outside of the borders of California. Um, and doing so will get you a carbon credit that you can then trade to big polluters who will, can buy it in the state of California. So they were actually making money, finding, buying, and destroying um, used Freon um, from you know random people throughout the United States. Um, what a strange job, right? Um, the thing that was really, really um, enticing to me about this, however, was that the kind of people that um, Sam was uh, encountering by buying this used Freon were the kinds of people, the exact kinds of people who tended to be, and this is a generalization, but it was nine times out of 10 true, um, global warming deniers, um, ultra conservative, very, um, very wary of the government in general, very wary of environmentalists, so-called. Um, and what was really interesting to me about this is that Sam, uh, who considers himself very progressive, was actually um, daily, weekly, um, encountering people uh, who he might not have uh, encountered on the other side of a political divide. Um, this was really in 2015, 2016. So this really attracted to me because in a time when we're told again and again and again that Americans are more divided than ever, here Sam was weekly having conversations with people who he fiercely disagreed with, especially about climate. Um, often, sometimes um, they would refuse to sell the Freon to Sam because they realized that he was what they called a carbon guy. They didn't want him to destroy it for carbon credits. Um, even though it shouldn't really matter to them what he does with it. Um, so I was really interested in these interactions. And I, after a little while uh, of interviewing him, uh, I was, I asked if I could go along with him. So we spent a day and um, we went, we drove from Memphis where I'm from to New Orleans. And I saw um, a whole bunch of these interactions um, and all of them were very, um, quite bizarre. Uh, <clears throat> um, just because the circumstances of it are bizarre enough. Um, but but some fascinating sort of characters, um, you know, especially in the South. Um, so I was really interested in this because Sam, um, who's still a close friend of mine, but who sometimes we disagree with in terms of um, climate politics, Sam really saw his work as, um, as destroying this Freon. Um, but I started to see his work or the really inspiring part of his work as his ability to um, talk with people across a political divide. And in one case, um, really changed the mind of somebody. Um, so towards the end of the, the book, I describe an encounter with someone who I call um, the Iceman, which was not his real name, but he used this kind of um, code name that everyone knew him by. And um, this was one of those people that had told Sam right from the get-go, oh, you're one of those carbon guys, get off my property. And this was early in Sam's career, and Sam um, used it for whatever reason as an opportunity to kind of challenge him um, and ask, well, what does it matter to you what I do with this? And that question, that kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, tense but also careful encounter with a question um, led to a very robust conversation about climate. And this uh, hostile interaction actually turned into, um, and part of it I think is just Sam's charm, um, but it turned into um, a friendship and a friendship that lasted many years. So much so that um, the two became such good friends that the Iceman um, ended up uh, really tragically having um, a uh, diagnosed with a terminal illness. And um, he was given about uh, just a few weeks to live. and. Um, this was somebody who was known in the Midwest as um, somebody who uh, was a major reclaimer. Uh, he would take old machines, um, old refrigerant gases, and then resell them on the secondary market and had, you know, tons and tons and tons of this stuff. And um, he invited Sam to his property um, well into their friendship. Um, and told him that he was going to leave all of his Freon to Sam to sell. And he said, I finally get it. It's about the next generation. 
Um, it's about the, the the generations that come after. And I mean, I would argue it's about our generation as well. Um, but uh, I was really moved by the story and um, I, I tried to do it justice in the book. Um, so those interactions um, really form the spine of the book. Um, initially, I thought it was gonna write a profile of Sam. Um, that it was really gonna be all about how this person was doing uh, this kind of heroic work. But interestingly, the more I started to learn about cap and trade, the cap and trade system, the more I became very critical of it um, and have become highly critical of it. And this is where Sam and I diverge, although Sam does completely different work now. Um, uh, he he does fascinating work with um, soil restoration. But anyway, um, I started to um, believe what a lot of critics have, I think, wisely said about cap and trade, which is that uh, on the one hand, it, it works in theory, but it often uh, leaves a lot of loopholes. And um, uh, two, it creates a market for pollution. It incentivizes pollution um, because it incentivizes the destruction of pollution. So um, this is uh, not a very hopeful way forward because we have to think about a way to um, you know, incentivize alternative um, energy systems and other things. Um, and if we keep incentivizing um, the destruction of pollution, um, then we're not de-incentivizing pollution. Um, so I hope that makes sense. But um, I became very critical of it as a, as a system, as a real solution forward. However, uh, what I think was interesting is that this for, for this particular chemical, which is called dichlorodifluoromethane, um, Freon-12, um, I actually saw it as um, working for this. And the reason for that is because um, nobody makes it anymore. So when you have a kind of finite store of that, um, then it, I think cap and trade, which uh, caps the amount that big polluters in a certain area, in this case, California can um, pollute. Um, and then they can trade a certain um, number of those emissions for pollution destroyed elsewhere. Um, I'm not going to go into the sort of mechanics of that because it's a little bit um, uh, confusing, but um, I did see this particular chemical as, um, as, as, a, as a viable solution, but um, wary of the whole system overall. So anyway, that was my quirky way into um, what became something entirely different. I realized that this story was way bigger than Sam. Um, way bigger than these interactions, although they were, they were fascinating and they take up a big chunk of the book. Um, and what I got sucked into was the history of Freon. What is this chemical, I wondered? Um, and for that matter, what is the history of air conditioning? I really didn't know at all. Um, I grew up in the South. I grew up with air conditioning. I grew up loving air conditioning. Um, so it's not as if this is something that is foreign or something that I... Um, jumped into uh, as a polemic against. And um, the book is not a polemic against air conditioning at all. But um, I began to see its connection to the climate crisis, and um, which is quite unsettling to me as somebody who um, historically has loved air conditioning um, and also sees it as pretty um, vital in some cases now to our everyday life, about which I'll get to later. Um, so I started to do a deep dive of not just Freon, but air conditioning. Um, the book has um, a huge historical mode. It tells, tries to tell the story of air conditioning in three parts. Um, before Freon, so air conditioning existed before Freon. There are other refrigerants other than Freon, um, which I found e extremely telling. And I'll talk about it in just a second. Um, then the age of Freon. Um, so the proliferation of this chemical and then its consequences, um, which were very terrifying, but also hopeful, I think. And then um, after Freon, the the sort of afterlife of um, Freon, which we're living through right now. So um, air conditioning existed before, excuse me, sorry. Air conditioning existed before Freon. Um, there are a number of uh, refrigerants, um, but the thing about the refrigerants before Freon is that they were often poisonous, explosive, or sometimes both. Um, so we had a refrigerant leak, um, say, in a movie theater in the 1920s. Um, ammonia was a common refrigerant. And when you had an ammonia leak, 
I don't know if you've used ammonia a lot, but it's quite unpleasant and can lead to people going up and, and vomiting, leaving and vomiting outside. Um, it's a kind of chemical gas leak. You do not want it. It's not good for business. Um, so it was really hard to air condition big spaces. Um, so all throughout the early history of air conditioning, there was this need from corporations for some kind of miracle refrigerant that was totally safe. But the early stages of air conditioning are really were really fascinating to me. And um, uh, there were some surprising discoveries to me. Um, one of the weirdest ones was that you would think that this um, air conditioning, this thing that you know most of us love so much, um, especially in the South, um, that history would have been waiting for this and that when it came, um, we would have embraced it fully. But the historical record proves otherwise. Um, uh, the first working air conditioner was invented by a man, a physician named Dr. John Gorey in about 1840 um, in Florida, in the panhandle of Florida and a place called Apalachicola. And Dr. Gorey was a physician who was treating malaria patients um, and was um, very intent on making the lives of those uh, people with malaria um, a little bit uh, easier. Um, they, they were incredibly feverish. Uh, the death rate was very high. Um, and he knew that if you took a block of ice and you fanned um, a breeze in front of it, it cooled the air somewhat and it comforted the patient. So he had the idea, uh, why not um, create a machine that could do this? Um, the basic knowledge of a air conditioner was known for several decades at that point, at the end of the 18th century. So he was really the first person to kind of harness it into a machine, a kind of big, clunky, awkward, noisy machine. And it worked. Um, and this person, Dr. Gorey, thought he was going to be a rich man. Um, he uh, patented one version of it and traveled all up and down the eastern seaboard looking for a, um, uh, uh, a patron who would support the you know, slight revising of the machine so that it would be more efficient. Um, and that, you know, they could really sell this to people, um, especially wealthy patrons. Um, he couldn't find an investor. Nobody wanted to invest in it. It was too strange. It was too out there. Um, and at that point, sweating, especially in the South, had become a kind of way of life, almost like a mark of, um, of resilience, um, of character. And um, he did find one investor in New Orleans who died before he committed. Um, Dr. John Gorey, um, ironically, died of himself of malaria, the very disease he was trying to treat. Um, and that was a sort of false start in the history of air conditioning. Um, and it really didn't get started going again until the early 1900s. And I think that really shows you that um, it was almost a, a full half century, sorry, a little more than a full half century of there being this knowledge that um, something like an air conditioner could work, but no one really pursued it. Um, things really started to change um, in the early 1900s, but not because of comfort. Um, they, they sort of happened for one huge reason, and that was profit. So in the uh, early 1900s, um, as the kind of large scale manufacturing was really ramping up towards the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, you had these big factories that often were at the whim of the change in climate, change in seasons, really, not climate, um, change in weather. Um, uh, one example was a printing press that was having trouble printing a magazine um, in the summer because the humidity and the heat was making the ink run. So they would um, uh, waste hundreds of issues of their magazine. And so one of the first major successful air conditioning projects was um, Willis Carriers of Carrier Air Conditioning, which you probably heard of. A young engineer, mechanical engineer, was put on this uh, printing press problem to try to figure out a way to make the printing press stop um, running its ink. And he invented really um, the first modern industrial air conditioner that was successful. And um, it had nothing to do with personal comfort. It had to do with, again, profit. The other major historical episode in this early um, time was on Wall Street of all places. And if that's not about profit, I don't know what is. Um, and it actually was um, to 
to comfort people, but again, in service to profit. It was because um, the building that they built on 11 Broad Street, the one that's still there, excuse me, um, was uh, not very, uh, was very um, heat, it was very hot. Um, it wasn't very ventilated. Um, and what was happening was that in the summer, the traders on Wall Street had to take a break during some of the hottest days. Um, they were not able to work in the building. Well, that's not great for the stock market. It's not great for Wall Street. Um, so uh, they hired another mechanical engineer, a different one, um, to um, invent a, a mechanical ventilation uh, system, basically air conditioning system, that would cool the traders in order to keep capital flowing. So again, I think these are two um, really telling um, events that were turned out not to be unique at all. Um, but resonate through the entirety of the history of air conditioning. That really from its early days and through decades and decades and decades, um, air conditioning was really a tool for profit, not really a tool, certainly not a tool for survival um, until very recently, and um, uh, not a tool for comfort until really the 70s and 80s, um, which was such a surprise to me. Um, the sort of other major, the next major node of air conditioning history was movie theaters, as many of you might know. Um, again, a tool for profit. Um, you could, a movie theaters would often shut down in the summer because if you think about it, in order to project a movie, you have to block out all the windows. Um, you can't have a fan running because of the sound. Um, it's an extremely hot, stuffy box. Um, so uh, in order to run a movie theater in the summer, so that you don't suffocate, you have to um, air condition it. But interestingly, um, so air conditioning became a selling point for summer movies. Um, and some of you might remember, uh, you know, in the you know, 60s and 70s and 80s, you still had um, movie theaters, movie, movie palaces advertising air conditioning as a selling point. Um, and what was interesting about that was that it, it was a air conditioning as it works best, which is um, a kind of comfortable temperature that you don't notice. That's a really hard sell. How do you sell something that works best when you notice it least? And so the thing that movie theaters used to do was they would crank the air conditioning up super, super high so that if you were coming out from uh, you know, a summer heat wave and you stepped into the movie theater, it felt great for about two minutes. And then you had to sit through an hour and a half, two hour movie um, shivering. Um, so it really, again, was not about personal comfort. It was about luring customers into the movie theater long enough so that they could buy a ticket. Um, and little about the patron's comfort. Um, World War II was instrumental for air conditioning. It, uh, sorry, uh, I've skipped the huge part, which is that <laughs> during right, uh, at the end of the twenties and thirties, just after the boom of, um, uh, movie theaters, um, we have the the invention of Freon. Um, finally, here it comes, the miracle refrigerant that is supposedly completely safe. And according to all evidence at the time, Freon was safe, at least on a personal level. Um, it was non-toxic. Um, it was non-explosive. In fact, it was used, or a version of it was used, um, in uh, fire extinguishers. So not only was it um, non-explosive, it put out flames. Um, and this was a huge deal, especially for the corporations that were making it, um, because it meant that you could expand the air conditioning infrastructure in a huge, say, auditorium, and that it could be super safe. Um, so we have this um, air conditioning boom that, um, was delayed through the depression and World War II because it's mostly of economic reasons. But then after the economic boom, um, uh, after World War II, and especially the housing boom, you finally have um, air conditioning that enters the home. Um, and before I get to that, I just wanna say that um, the person who invented it um, is one of the uh, 20th century's just most spectacular um, kooks. His name was Thomas, Thomas Midgley Jr., an American, um, 
and he worked for General Motors, their Frigidaire division. Um, and uh, he was strangely trained um, not as a chemist, um, as you would think, but as a mechanical engineer. He really didn't know anything about chemistry. And his method, if it could be called that, was kind of akin to a mad scientist. Um, he actually had another invention, um, and that invention was leaded gasoline. Um, so he invented both Freon, which nearly destroyed all life on the planet um, because of the ozone layer, and he invented leaded gasoline, the effects of which um, some parts of the world are still dealing with, um, and horrible effects, toxic effects. Um so that uh, one environmental historian said that, um, has claimed that um, no single organism on the planet, including cyanobacteria, which created all oxygen on the planet, no other single organism on the planet has had a greater effect on the planet's atmosphere than Thomas Vigili Jr. Um, he was a wild kind of um, scientist. Uh, his method for trying to find leaded gas gasoline, um, at the time there was a, a, a problem in car engines called knock, um, where it would, uh, sort of eat up the gasoline and make the engine, um, less efficient. And General Motors was trying to find a, um, chemical solution to this. And they put Thomas Midgley, even though he's not trained in chemistry, um, on the job. Thomas Midgley Jr.'s, um, method for finding a chemical alternative, uh, sorry, a chemical solution to this was just to pour random chemicals into the gasoline and see if they worked. Um, he tried about 120, but you or I could definitely do that. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that sort of by chance he found, he poured a bottle of iodine in there and um, found that there was a component that could work um, and then eventually hit on leaded gasoline. Um, that was a known scandal at the time. Um, it, uh, uh, leaded gasoline plant workers died. Um, it, it was a known toxin. Um, it became incredibly controversial and scandalous. Um, his other invention, Freon, um, CFCs, um, went off without a hitch. Um, it really seemed to live up to its expectations of being um, completely safe. Of course, the irony is that it was not safe. Um, but we didn't really understand that until the 70s, when two... Um, Two scientists uh, named Mario Molina and Sherry Rowland um, discovered the possibility of uh, CFCs destroying the ozone layer. And they figured this out quite brilliantly as a theoretical possibility first and published a paper on it. CFCs are so stable that they don't interact with anything. Um, they're so stable that they, because they didn't act, interact with anything, they were wafting up into the stratosphere where they were... Um, messing with the stratosphere's very delicate um, chemistry. And what was happening was uh, they were bonding with ozone molecules um, and letting in more of the sun's ultraviolet radiation, which is extremely dangerous. Um, without the ozone layer, um, one writer put it, um, it's the only thing standing between us and speedy death. It is the only reason why when we walk outside, our skin doesn't burn in two to three minutes. Um, no life, not just human life, but no life except for maybe um, uh, very simple bacteria um, could survive without the ozone layer. Um, most of the planet's life formed with it. So all to say, very important. Um, and in the 70s, it was not really understood that the ozone layer could be uh, endangered in this way. Um, there was a lot of pushback from it. Um, lots of scientists, often corporate scientists who were paid by the corporations who were making Freon, um, pushed against this. And that whole battle is in the, in the book and has been told elsewhere, too. But it's really a, a, a testament to uh, the integrity of the scientists, especially Roland and Molina, um, who pushed through um, and fought for um, this. Um, what came out of that is one of the hopeful nodes of the book. Um, and uh, through the 80s, it became very clear that we needed a kind of international agreement to address um, CFCs, that if we didn't, it was going to destroy the planet. 
And what came out of that was um, something that happened through the UN. Um, and it ended up being called the Montreal Protocol. And the Montreal Protocol is, um, I think, one of the one of history's most hopeful lessons and something we still, if we don't already know the story of, we need to pay attention to, because I think that um, it is a lesson for the present, for the future, really. Um, and the reason is because it's the world's uh, first and only successful international legally binding environmental agreement to lower and end emissions of a substance. Um, the famous Paris Agreement, um, which was uh, agreed on at uh, a COP uh, conference of the parties a few years back, which was supposed to limit um, carbon dioxide, CO2 emissions, um, was non-binding. Uh, it was non-legally binding, um, which is not very helpful when you're really trying to um, make uh, uh, achieve results that work. So um, the Montreal Protocol was legally binding, and um, it was also had a, a clause in it that uh, made it um, possible that they had to meet every year to assess the scientific record. And that constant revising of a agreement that at first wasn't totally perfect, and every year they met and revised it in a better way, in a better way, in a better way, so that really by the early 90s, they had not only phased down um, CFCs, they had phased them out entirely. Um, and corporations were finding that um, they could uh, make alternatives and um, make alternatives for um, a lot more money. Um, so that sort of brings us into the present era, which is the sort of afterlife of Freon. Um, and I wanna kind of double back and say two things that I found or, or sorry, one thing that I found pretty um, surprising through this, which was that um, I was surprised in my research to find a theme that I found um, again and again and again, um, but I probably should not have um, being a, a student of American history as I could. And this was the a very uncomfortably close history of air conditioning with the history of eugenics and systemic racism. Um, I'll give you one example, early example, and then um, we'll also kind of take you through to the present. But um, I had heard that Benjamin Franklin um, in the late 18th century had conducted a pretty early cooling experiment. Um, and the, all the histories kind of mentioned this letter that um, where he explains what he did to a physician. Um, but they don't really quote the letter or they don't talk about what else was in the, the letter. So I decided to, to look it up. And um, hearing the advice of some of my mentors, always look at the original source material, um, I decided, why not? How long could the letter be? And I found the letter easily uh, in an archive, and um, I'm glad that I did, because it was very short, four pages. The first two pages are a um, incredibly accurate description of how mechanical cooling works. That's pretty much how an air conditioner works today, which is remarkable for, you know, 17, uh, I forget the date exactly, but uh, it's about 1760. Um, and, uh, the latter two pages are about how that cooling is going to be very important for white men. Um, but the enslaved Africans do not need it because their biology is different and, uh, they don't need, uh, air conditioning because they can withstand hotter temperatures and more pain, which is not true, obviously, by the way. Um, this was, um, a common, um, racist a uh, biological assumption at the time that um, the biology of enslaved Africans um, of non-white people was often different um, and justified um, the uh, violence toward them. Um, that was not an outlier in terms of the way that air conditioning was handled. Um, we see that resonate through the 20th century when um, white movie theaters were air conditioned, but black movie theaters, and yes, there were separate ones, um, were not or they were separated into air-conditioned zones and non-air-conditioned zones. Um, we see it resonate through the um, redlining of um, the 1950s and 60s. Um, all white enclaves were given um, subsidized mortgages um, as part of the sort of GI Bill and 
uh, post-World War II economics. And those mortgages included subsidized air conditioning. So with their houses came um, low, lower cost air conditioning. This was not true for non-white residents, for black residents, for Jewish residents, um, et cetera. Um, so who had and did not have air conditioning then began to be divided by uh, race and class through the latter half of the 20th century. And we see it resonate still. There is still that um, gap as well, um, but something else has happened. And that is that we can see, um, I'm gonna get to that something else actually in just a second. But before I do, I wanna talk about the ultimate irony in our kind of present moment of Freon, and then I'll sort of wrap up and we can have some questions. Um, and that is that the alternatives to Freon were something called HFCs, um, which are still very pre present, but actually we're beginning to phase those down too. Um, not only uh, were uh, CFCs ozone destroyers, but they were actually terrible global warming gases, still are, obviously. Um, HFCs, which came after them, did not destroy the ozone layer. However, they were highly potent global warming gases, and knowingly so at the time. So we replaced one planet destroyer with another. And now we're trying to phase that out again. And air conditioning, so a lot of the systems that are in place right now use a refrigerant that is a highly potent global warming gas. It's not the um, most, um, if you look at what causes the most warming, uh, HFCs, uh, refrigerants, are nowhere near the most um, uh, forceful in that way. But um, molecule for molecule, they're thousands of times more potent than carbon dioxide, for instance. So even though there's a small amount of them, they can do a lot of damage. Um, and Mario Molina, actually right before he died, um, said that if we stopped production of HFCs, it would actually prevent 0.5 degrees Celsius of warming um, in the next 50 years. That's a lot, um, especially since we're we're trying to keep um, the, the uh, degree of warming at 1.5 degrees, um, because we know that if we get to two degrees Celsius, there's going to be even more violence and havoc in parts of the world than there is now. So that, cut, that cutting down um, HFCs uh, could actually prevent uh, that 0.5 degrees of warming. Um, that's one way that air conditioning is implicated in global warming right now. The other way is through energy. Um, as most of you know, I'm sure, um, air conditioning takes an enormous amount of energy. It's hopeful because it's connected to electricity, but in this country, the vast majority of electricity still comes from non-renewable sources. Um, a little bit from um, nuclear, but most of it still from fossil fuels. And a lot of it wasted. So not only is it come, coming from non-renewable sources, but the process of getting that, extracting that um, electricity is incredibly inefficient. So um, as the world um, demands more and more and more cooling, um, we have a problem because the problem is that um, the United States kind of um, engineered this way of living um, in living through air conditioning that um, the rest of the world, much of the rest of the world, which is beginning to become more and more uh, economically like the United States, um, they rightly are wanting more air conditioning. But, um, and they should have it um, in terms of certainly fairness, right? But what's very um, troubling to me is that um, we're sort of exporting this idea of comfort um, that is arguably not one that is making our world more comfortable. And this is ultimately what I'm exploring in the book, which is that a hope for us to kind of transform um, our uh, uh, imperative on personal comfort, sort of personal comfort at all odds, sorry, personal comfort against um, everyone else's comfort um, as the bottom line. Um, I'm hoping that we can try to think to transform that into something else, um, something more like planetary or public or community comfort. Um, and um, I don't think that actually um, a more air conditioned world is necessarily a more comfortable world. Um, I'll give you sort of one last 
example of um, how air conditioning um, today, and a hyper contemporary example, um, how it's problematic. Um, you might think that air conditioning is a great solution to, say, a heat wave. The irony is that the long history of air conditioning um, was for a very long time a history of comfort. Um, and then uh, not just air conditioning, but uh, the increased industrialization from very, very um, uh, uh, sorry, the increased yeah industrialization from um, developed parts of the world um, and especially from the wealthiest citizens has made the world hotter. So in a way, our cooling, our uh, demand for cooling has made the planet hotter in a sense. Um, so this tool that's been historically about comfort um, has now become uh, more and more about survival. And um, however, it's an incredibly imperfect tool for survival um, in a lot of ways. So you might think it's great in, um, say, an urban heat wave. But um, an incident in 2019 is very telling. Um, and I'll just quickly tell you what happened. Um, so I live in Brooklyn and we have an energy monopoly like um, the vast majority of the, the rest of the country called Con Edison, Con Ed. Um, they control the electricity around um, here uh, and we don't have an alternative. And um, during the heat wave, uh, there was a heat wave in 2019 um, where temperatures were pushed into uh, 103, 104. Um, it was very bad for a couple of days. A week before, there had been a power outage in Manhattan. Excuse me. Um, and uh, this was not during a heat wave, but um, there was, a, I'm not exactly sure what happened. But there was a huge power outage for a couple of um, hours and it being Manhattan, um, it being Times Square actually, um, they lost a lot of money in those hours. And so, um, during this heat wave, right before it, actually, um, the energy monopoly, um, afraid that there was going to be another power outage, this time in Brooklyn, um, went and shut off deliberately, um, deliberately shut off the power to neighborhoods in order to protect the integrity of the entire system. Now, what neighborhoods did they shut off? They did not shut off Times Square. They shut off predominantly um, the working class, the low income black and brown neighborhoods of Brooklyn. Um, in in uh, life threateningly uh, hot weather. So here is a great example of how air conditioning is only um, a good tool if you have it, um, or if you can afford to run the energy for it, or if you even have electricity on a day in which the um, monopoly energy company chooses to um, cut off your electricity. So um, what I argue for, and we can talk more about this if we have time or want to, is um, uh, not a banning of air conditioning at all, but um, reorienting our thinking um, in a more community way. Um, there's lots of ways to do this, you know, better access to cooling centers, um, uh, planting um, more dense vegetation, better access to green spaces in our cities. Um, I'm very city focused because that's where the majority of our residents in this country live. Um, all these things can actually go a long way to help. And um, we see those play out. Um, we see the struggles, the sort of um, racist and redlining struggles of a hundred years ago play out in terms of which neighborhoods have um, shade giving cool uh, greenery and trees in which don't. Um, and so this is a way in which our our history um, in this country um, is quite alive with us. And it's really up to us to figure out how to take that um, knowledge um, and make a better um, world for ourselves. And I think a more comfortable world by not focusing just on the individual, but on all of us. Um, okay, I think that's um, that's what I had sort of planned on doing. So maybe we can talk about um, questions. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Eric, for uh, this fascinating overview overview of your book and distressing information. And um, 
uh, we um, we do have a question that's come in so far. I just want to remind everyone to please use the Q and A if you have a question. Um, so this first one is with extreme temperatures increasing, how will sort of societies survive in emerging economies in the mid latitude or hotter regions? It's such a great question, and I, I don't have a um, I don't have an easy answer, and I don't have a um, a definitive answer. Um, I think that uh, a huge thing that we face um, in the future is going to be what is sometimes called managed retreat. Um, and there's another part of this that I want to get into too, um, especially with uh, kind of um, uh, the global south, um, developing countries, um, whatever you want to call them. Um, we're actually seeing a kind of version of this. I, I don't know the the. Uh, I'm a little wary of it because they don't know all the details of it, but I don't know if you saw, but the federal uh, government, the United States has just given millions of dollars um, for a kind of managed retreat for three indigenous communities. Um, uh, I don't know the ins and outs of that, but um, it's interesting to me because that I think we're going to see more of that. I'm kind of surprised that the Biden administration um, uh, has done that. Uh, it was the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, I think in some of these mid-latitude regions, especially of uh, sub-Saharan regions and um, uh, that are um, forecast to be go through a lot of uh, desertification, um, that's really going to be the long-term solution is figuring out a just, um, equitable way to move those people. But how, to do, how do you do that, right? Um, I think this is what we're really fighting for in these um, COP conferences. Um, you know, the COP27 saw... Um, uh, uh, you know, it was called a, a success for the um, creation of the loss and damage fund, but I, I hardly think that um, it's a it's a success because it's many years overdue and it's not officially funded yet. But I think it's a certainly a step forward is that the wealthy nations, wealthier nations need to um, fund that retreat. Um, I think this is what makes it yeah. particularly difficult because um, already you are bringing into play uh, international um, politics in terms of border crossing um, and uh, immigrants. Um, and you're also talking about kind of a reparations fund. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't I don't think that technology will save us necessarily, but I do have hope that a kind of uh, um, more um, international uh, more just international policies will actually help um, with part of this. Yeah, um, some more questions that have come in. Um, how will new refrigerants and heat pumps improve our heating and cooling? Um, that's a great question. I think they will improve it greatly. I, I have a lot of hope in terms of, um, uh, I see there's another question about heat pumps. Heat pumps are great. They're like, um, they're great in terms of energy. Um, they're kind of like air conditioners in reverse. They make actually a, uh, from what I know about heat pumps, um, they make a bigger difference in terms of the heating. Um, so uh, you do use a lot of electricity in the winter, um, especially in the Northeast uh, where most of you are, I'm sure. Um, and uh, although that's changing, it's still true that, um, I think we're really right on the cusp. It used to be that more people died of, um, of uh, low temperatures than high, um, although we're kind of uh, really teetering on the edge of, of that. Um, so, which is all to say that there's a lot of energy used for heat. Um, heat pumps are really great. I, uh, that technology is great. One of the things I'm always worried about is a kind of techno fix, technological fix to a problem that is actually a more cultural, psychological, um, this is actually really about political economy. Yeah. Um, I'm not against technology in that way, but um, I, I I'm always want to make sure that we're kind of thinking about um, beyond the kind of techno fix. But heat pumps, great. I thought it was actually one of the questions I had written down while you were talking. Like, could you write the same book about like heat in a different way? You know, it's a great question. Um, you know, I I think so, and I think it would kind of take a different temporal scale. Um, 
you know, there was something that was called the, the little ice age, which um, happened, you know, at the really from the early modern period to the late 19th century. And so it would probably really be focused in those areas. And that had nothing to do. Uh, well, it's it's complicated, but it probably had nothing to do with human induced climate change, although there are some theories that it did. But um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think it would be interesting because you have this kind of history of wood burning stoves, and then you have a, a history of a kind of what was called sea coal. Um, one of my favorite sort of weird facts about um, early modern England, so, you know, late 16th century, early 17th century, is that the this was when the King James Version of the Bible was um, was translated into English. And nowhere in the Hebrew Bible uh, or, or the Greek is there a reference to hell as um, fire and brimstone or um, kind of... Um, but actually the translators chose to put that into that translation. And it is actually a description of London at the time, which is a lot of people burning sea coal um, because it smelled, it was this putrid um, sulfurous smell. So our idea of hell as the sort of burning um, sulfurous place is actually because of one of the early um, instances of urban industrialization. <laughs> wow. Um, there's another question in here, but I'm, I'm thinking maybe that would be good at, um, after, but Ricky, did you, did you have a question and not to put you on the spot? No, no, I do have a question. Um, so, you know, I lived through this, the whole ozone hole in the ozone period, um, and was pretty impressed with the the the, the world coming together and actually solving this problem. I see climate change. Obviously, the, the whole and your skin burning in two to three minutes is probably maybe a little bit more convincing, but the data out there and the projections out there um, are are devastating with climate change. Why is it that the world came together on ozone so quickly? I mean, I don't know whether you thought about this through the writing of the book, and yet climate change is still presenting such a um, a, a huge problem for all of the countries to agree on. It's a really good question. And, um, uh, you know, in one sense, I think there's an answer that's um, that is in a way the ozone uh, solution was a was a kind of a quick fix. We just switched chemicals. Um, and actually, the corporations made a lot of money off of that. So it was a kind of win-win situation. Um, it's not that easy to switch um, energy sources. You know, you're talking about a, a higher level thing. But actually, something that I explore in the book, which um, is speculative, but also um, I really try to uh, sit with that speculation, is that um, it is connected to this idea, this systemic racism. And it's that in the 80s, um, the in the United States, in Australia, and in Britain, the ozone crisis was framed um, in terms of uh, skin cancer. And not just in terms of skin cancer, but in terms of the susceptibility of fair-skinned people to skin cancer. I want to be clear that um, skin cancer from sun radiation, even today, is a danger for everyone, regardless of um, how much melanin you have in your skin. Um, it's true that it uh, white people burn more easily, but um, there is unseen damage in black skin, for instance. But um, my point is that the way that it was framed to the public um, was um, often talked about as if it were a white crisis, as a white person's crisis. Um, the the countries that were manufacturing Freon mostly were the United States, um, Australia, Russia, uh, and most of Europe. Um, and, you know, when you look at that, there are also places at the high and low latitudes. And again, this is a kind of result of the history of colonization. And I don't think that's 
a coincidence. Um, okay. So one of the things that I really speculate is, is to think about to what extent, I'm not saying it's entirely because of that, but to what extent this was because it was framed as endangering the lives, first and foremost, of white people. And that if that had some part in it, then we should seriously consider um, the, that troubling, troubling um, implication, um, which is that if it had been reversed, if it had been um, targeting the lives of black and brown people, would we have acted on it? And I don't, I think the answer is no. And um, that's troubling. And I think that we should, I think that deals with, um, with uh, it reminds us of the importance of this movement as a, as a justice movement, as environmental justice. Um, and I don't think you can separate those things, um, you know, race and, um, and a kind of justice equity for humanity. Um, so that, that is something that I kind of speculate about in the book, but it, it's a really great question. Um, there was a, there was a comment just talking to summarize shortly, but that dirty truth of uh, heat pumps is that all systems leak refrigerant. And so this is urgently needed change. And I just wanted to comment on that. But um, maybe the last question can be, um, the problems presented in your book are daunting. What has been the reaction to the book and anything hopeful? And if I can sneak in also, what are some of the ways that you comfort yourself in kind of extreme weather? Totally, such a great question. Um, definitely hope, a lot of hope. And we were talking about, the three of us were talking about this a little bit before, and I, I wanna sort of share some of that. But um, I think that it's interesting. There's been a, um, a real knee-jerk reaction on the right, which was surprising to me. Um, I didn't expect the sort of political right in the country to pay attention to the book at all. Um, and um, I, I, apparently it was glossed or referenced on a Fox News program. And suddenly my Twitter feed was full of DMs of people telling me that I should die in a heat wave, <laughs> which is hilarious to me. Um, Sorry. But um but it kind of further, um, uh, it was fascinating to me because it, it was really not surprising. Um, this, and I think something we should pay attention to when we're, you know, in the climate crisis, that we can't ignore the feelings that people have, um, say for, you know, diesel engines and cars, you know, there's strong feelings attached to that. And that doesn't mean that, that we need to let people have their gas guzzling cars, for instance. But I think that we we shouldn't treat people like they're um, like they're idiots, you know, or that their feelings for that stuff don't, don't matter. Um, I think it's complicated, and I, I think we should really address that going forward. Um, I think progressives have a have a really bad um, tendency to dismiss um, uh, positions that are not theirs as as idiotic. Um, I think it's easier to sort of meet people, or I think it's better to meet people where they are, though it's harder. Um, so that was a surprising reaction to it. Um, uh, I have gotten, uh, you know, a lot of um, uh, great comments from people saying that um, it's manageable to think about the climate in terms of something so narrow. And that was really my um, my hope in writing this book was that I wanted to try to see this thing that was um, unmanageable for me to think about in terms of this one molecule. It's really kind of a, a kind of history of the United States through a single molecule. And um, that kind of really niche history, um, I was able to see a part of the climate crisis that I wasn't before. And um, that access to knowledge, it, it feels like I can um, I can sort of manage my emotions around it. In terms of hope, um, sometimes people ask me, you know, is there hope? Um, and it's a funny question to me because I think that we... Um, I think sometimes we confuse ourselves as to what hope is. And to me, hope is never, um, doesn't mean that things are all gonna, gonna be all right um, in the end. To me, that's optimism. And I, I think that's almost never warranted. Um, at the same time, pessimism is just the other side of optimism, the certainty that things are gonna be terrible in the future. I don't believe that. I think it's a kind of hubris to assume that we know what's gonna happen. And that's where hope lives. Hope is really all about uncertainty. Um, we don't hope that the sun will rise tomorrow. We know that it will. Um, if we don't know what it is, 
then it goes into that category of hope. And that can be really scary, I think, if you don't know what something is. Um, that uncertainty is terrifying. But I think it's also the um, the the condition for um, for change. And um, I think that's kind of how it has to be um, for things to, to change in the future. Um, so I don't really think we know what's going to happen. And I think that that's kind of a beautiful thing. Um, I think that that should really... Um, goad us into fighting for a better world, um, maybe even a more comfortable world for, for all of us. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing all this. And I highly recommend everyone get a copy of this book or you can get it through the library. Um, I want to thank uh, Ricky for appearing and for LexCan for partnering with us. And thank you all for attending tonight. This program is recorded and will be on our YouTube page. Thank you again, Eric. This was fascinating. Thank you so much, Matt and Ricky. Have a great night, everyone. Have a good night.